Hi, Michelle Glass here. Welcome back to our final episode of our Chapter 28 lecture series. And we're actually going to dip here a little bit into Chapter 29, so we can go just a little bit into pregnancy and breastfeeding. We're going to be focusing primarily on the embryonic development very early on in pregnancy until um, we get to the development of the placenta and talk about how that pregnancy is maintained. And then we'll be talking a little bit about um, breast anatomy and moving into conversation on breastfeeding just a little bit. There's a whole lot more information in chapter 29 than what I'm talking about here. So if you are interested more in the details of the human development um, through the embryo and fetus, if you're interested in the changes that are happening in the mother during pregnancy, um, then you really want to go ahead and read your chapter 29. So we're taking a look here at the female reproductive tract and we see that there are some sperm that have made their way to the uterine tube. Now those sperm can make their way here in a matter of um, 30 minutes to a couple hours um, and they can actually exist or live in the female reproductive tract for about five days. So as long as you're having intercourse around five days of ovulation, then you can have possible implantation of pregnancy. Now notice I haven't really drawn any of the tissues in of the uterus. We'll add those in a little bit later. So when we talk about ovulation, remember we are seeing the release of a secondary oocyte or immature ovum into the pelvic cavity, but those fimbrae are nestled there around the ovary and are important in really sweeping that secondary oocyte into the uterine tube where it can then come in contact with those waiting sperm. So fertilization typically happens about one, uh, within one day um, of the ovulation or, or about one day after ovulation. So again, as long as you're timing intercourse around that ovulation period, then you have potential for um, pregnancy. When the haploid sperm fuses with the haploid um, ovum, we're going to get our diploid zygote, and that would be the day zero of our embryonic development here. From there, you have a special type of cell division um, where we see the single zygote becoming two cells and then two cells becoming four until ultimately we get to a morula stage, which is really just a ball of cells, which it then changes into a blastula or blastocyst is how we talk about it for humans. And that's basically a ball of hollow cells. So you get some reorganization that's happening there. It's around day seven to 10 that we see implantation of that blastocyst into the uterus. And notice now, because I'm drawing the implantation, I wanna show you that it's embedding into that uh, functional zone of the endometrium um, and that you have that myometrial tissue there. So I wasn't, I was leaving it out just for simplification before, not because all of a sudden we're getting those changes here. Now we will see after implantation the release of human chorionic gonadotropin or little h, big C, big G. Human chorionic gonadotropin um, is going to continue um, to maintain the corpus luteum for about three to four months. Corpus luteum, remember, is that structure in the ovary that is releasing progesterone, and that is going to be important in maintaining that um, pregnancy. So remember, the um, high level of progesterone is going to prevent menses from occurring, so you're maintaining that functional zone, which it needs to be there while the embryo is implanting, and as we start to get the formation of the placenta. After that four, fourth month there, um, the corpus luteum goes away and the placenta pretty much is taking over in the production of hormone that will be maintaining the pregnancy. The embryo does start to form that placenta pretty early on. So by about the third week, we're starting to see development of the placenta. The placenta is very interesting because it's actually an organ that's shared between two individuals. So we do see that a portion of the placenta is formed by the fetus, but also we see a portion of that placenta um, is made of maternal tissue. So we have these structures called chorionic villi, which are coming from that embryo, which are gonna enlarge and branch. Um, 
in, in, into the endometrium lining, forming the fetal portion of the placenta. Embedded in each of these villi, you have embryonic um, blood vessels. The job of the placenta then is to allow for gas and nutrient and waste exchange between the fetal blood supply and the maternal blood supply. Now it's important to note that you don't actually have mixing of the two blood supplies, but rather you have fetal capillary side by side with maternal capillary, and so you're just seeing diffusion and exchange happening between. The placenta then is also important in releasing a whole group of hormones that are helping to make changes in the mother as well as helping to maintain that pregnancy. So we will see the release of human placental lactogen, lactogen, excuse me, placental prolactin, which is very similar to the prolactin that we've talked about as being released by the adenohypophysis. We see here that the placenta is releasing estrogens and progesterone, so they're picking up where the corpus luteum leaves off and maintaining uh, that pregnancy. And then we also have another hormone called relaxin. Now of this list, the two that are new to us are the human placental lactogen and the relaxin. So let's take a look at these. HPL is going to help prep the mammary glands for milk production. So it's not until we get to formation of the placenta that we get to have this um, particular hormone being released. So that means you would have to have pregnancy and the formation of the placenta to get full development of the mammary glands. Relaxin is important in increasing the flexibility of the pubic symphysis so we can have a little bit more stretch, allowing for the um, passage of the head through the birth canal. It's also going to be important in dilating the cervix and it's going to be suppressing the release of the hormone oxytocin which is going to help to delay a premature labor. Oxytocin we'll see is a hormone that will cause myometrial contractions so it will be an important hormone in labor and delivery. Mammary glands are composed of these clusters of what are called lobules. So they look like little bunches of grapes, and each of these feeds into what's called the lactiferous duct, which empties into a larger um, space called the lactiferous sinus. The lactiferous sinus is then what's going to empty that milk to the surface of the nipple. Now, um, the Nipple contains several openings because you can have 15 to 20 lactiferous sinuses per nipple. So it's not like a hose, which is one opening and the milk flowing out there like kind of a, a superficial or um, artificial is the word I wanted, an artificial nipple. But instead you're going to have multiple holes. So it's more like a little sprinkler system uh, releasing that milk. In a resting inactive breast, um, those mammary glands are going to be consisting mostly of ducts, so you're not going to have a lot of fully developed lobules. Most of the size of the breast, especially pre-pregnancy, is just coming to the collection of adipose tissue that we see there. You have to have a pregnancy, you have to have a formation of placenta before you can get the completion uh, of the development of the mammary gland tissue. So in a, a female who has not had a pregnancy, all, all or most of that breast tissue is composed of adipose tissue. Mammary gland development um, is regulated by a host of hormones. So we see some of these are only showing up during pregnancy, such as the human placental lactogen, as mentioned, as well as the placental prolactin. And then these others are being produced uh, strictly by the mother. So thyroxin and growth hormone, progesterone, estrogen, and prolactin. So clearly you have to have the formation of the placenta before you can have full functioning of those um, mammary glands. This development is really finished by the six months of pregnancy. So milk production can be occurring before that pregnancy is complete. Prolactin is going to continue being released by the adenohypophysis. It's going to be important in maintaining milk production even after delivery um, of that infant. The milk ejection reflex is a positive feedback mechanism. So what we'll see here is when the infant suckles, that's going to trigger a nerve impulse, which will cause the neurohypophysis to release the hormone oxytocin. 
Oxytocin, we mentioned, will cause myometrial um, contractions and is important in labor and delivery. Here we see that these contractions or this um, oxytocin will cause contraction in the myoepithelial cells in those lactiferous ducts and sinuses, triggering the release of milk. The more the infant sucks, the more milk that is released. So you will see if an infant is sucking for five minutes, then you are releasing milk for five minutes. If that infant is sucking for 20 minutes, then you are releasing milk for 20 minutes. Uh, so the more sucking, the more um, you're getting the release of the milk happening. So this is a nice example of a positive feedback mechanism. Now there are lots of benefits to breastfeeding for both the mother and the infant. So we've mentioned that oxytocin is gonna cause myometrial contractions as well as contractions here in the lactiferous ducts and sinuses. So contractions in the uterus can help um, return that uterus back to its pre-pregnancy shape um, and build that muscle tone. Um, even after being stretched out by the gestational period. So this is going to be really beneficial to um, that mother. The initial milk that's produced is actually called colostrum. Um, this is the first um, secretion in the first two to three days. So we don't actually talk about milk coming in until the second or third day um, of breastfeeding. This initial milk is probably, or this colostrum, is probably the most important that the infant can receive. So even if you don't have intention of breastfeeding um, your infant, you do want to try to administer this colostrum um, by breastfeeding at least the first one to two days. The colostrum is going to contain more proteins than we see in regular milk and less fat. So there's not going to be a whole lot of weight gain that's going to be happening here initially first couple days with the infant, um, but you are going to be delivering important antibodies. So this is going to give you some of that natural um, passive immunity that we talked about early on. And also there are mucins available in the colostrum as well as the later milk which can be important in inhibiting viral replication. So this can help um, prevent retroviruses that can cause diarrhea and other illnesses in infants. After that second or third day, you're gonna to start to see your milk coming in and that milk is released with each nursing session. Now there's actually two different types of milk that's coming out in each session. Initially, you have four milk, which is very watery. This is basically quenching the thirst of the infant. It provides uh, fluid and proteins and amino acids and sugars and salts, but not very much fat. So an infant that's latching on and just nursing for a short period of time is receiving only the four milk and may not um, be showing a lot of weight gain because they're not getting the fatty uh, lipid component of the hind milk. So the infant has to latch on and nurse for you know maybe 15 minutes before fully getting to that hind milk. So a longer nursing session can be important for that infant in order to have quality weight gain. Lysozyme is another important component to breast milk that is not going to be found in artificial formulas. Lysozyme has antibiotic properties, so we do see that breast milk is giving a lot of immune protection to infants that you're not going to be able to get in an artificial formula. The other thing that's pretty interesting about breast milk is that um, the composition of the milk does change based on the maternal diet. So um, you can see different flavors and so forth coming through um, in that diet. And also, we see that the composition of that breast milk changes with the age of the infant, which makes sense because its nutritional needs should be changing as well. Okay, and we have finally completed the reproductive system.